Welcome to the North Carolina State Council's Virtual Council. My name is Roger Green Jr. and I'll be your host during this council experience. For the next three days, we're going to bless the Lord through singing and through ministry and through the word of the Lord. We're going to fellowship here virtually and give God the praise that is due his name. Just to think, 12 months ago, we were on the cusp of a pandemic. Test kits. It's a virus like the flu. COVID-19 can be characterized as a pandemic. We will be suspending all travel from Europe. Customers have been snapping up everything in sight. The family of the victim, 26-year-old Brianna Taylor, shot in an officer-involved shooting on Friday morning, is speaking out. My administration is recommending that all Americans avoid gathering in groups of more than 10 people. Direct all individuals to shelter at their place of residence. Long lines and hours of delays as travelers returning from Europe had to undergo screenings for the coronavirus. Stocks going down. Gold is going down. Credit's going down. Everybody's in complete liquidation mode. I remember sitting in my hotel in Durham, North Carolina, during our council experience, and we were trying to figure out how we were going to navigate through the pandemic. We eventually, through our leadership, had to cut our council session short. We had to go through the process of dealing with how we were going to get through from our church's standpoint in the pandemic. You know, were we going to go to church? Were we not going to go to church? Uh, we had to get through being sheltered in place. We had to get through wearing masks and, and how we were going to navigate through social events. But through it all, God took us through these 12 months with grace and with dignity. And I'd like to applaud each and every one of you for being just a good sport, getting through it, for bearing with us here at the North Carolina State Council, even as we fellowship virtually, we have not missed a beat. And we owe all of that to great leadership and to the glory of God. So we thank God for you. I want you to do me a favor. I want you to share this broadcast because we want to get as many people on our virtual platform as possible. Remember, sharing is caring. And I want you to share this because you don't know who might be blessed by the messages and the songs and the testimonies that will be given over the next three days. Somebody might be healed, delivered, and set free. I believe that God can convict, convince, and change someone and, and, and cause them to come into crisis, saving grace on these three days. So I want you to do that. Share that at this time. I have the privilege and the honor of introducing our very first speaker for the North Carolina State Council's Virtual Council for this March session. It's a person I've known my entire life. In fact, I don't think I've known anyone quite as long as I know this individual. He's a man of many hats. He has excelled in the entrepreneurial ranks. He has excelled in the military. He's a, he has excelled in academia. He has a doctorate degree in law. Just a man that has a plethora of accomplishments and experiences. He is a theologian par excellence. I promise you, you will be blessed from our clinician on today that will teach on the topic prayer, the panacea for the pandemic. And now, without further ado, I'd like to introduce to you Suffragan Bishop Roger Green Singer. Welcome to our council session. I'm Dr. Roger L. Green Sr., pastor and founder of Prayer and Deliverance Worldwide Ministries. And I am just so thankful for the opportunity to come before you and to start off our council. And we must start our council. We need to start it off with excitement. You got to get excited about what you're doing. You got to get excited about what God is going to do in our midst. And I'm excited to be able to come to you with the prayer clinic before we get started. We should always preface everything with prayer first, and we should close it out with prayer. And don't attempt to do anything before you have a word of prayer. And so before we do that, I want to have a word of prayer, and then we'll get right into the lesson. We have a very interesting theme that have been coined by our diocesan, Bishop Marion E. Wright Sr. Uh, of the 58th Episcopal District of the Pentecostal Assemblies of the World. We have a wonderful theme. That theme is Pandemic Recovery by Faith. And we're going to be talking about during this session, my topic is prayer, the panacea for the pandemic. And so let's look uh, unto the Lord. Let's have a few words of prayer uh, before we get started. And then at the end, we're going to close out with a prayer. And so I want you to make sure 
that you stay from the beginning to the end so that way you won't miss what's in the middle all right so father in jesus name lord we thank and we praise you right now for this occasion god we thank you for this platform god for this uh opportunity god to reach each one of our constituents and not only our constituents but the world at large and god we give you all the praise and the glory for your infinite foresight and being able to see, God, that we, this will be a blessing unto us when, God, we thought that things were going to get complicated and we were going to be shut down. But, God, you had a way of escape, as you have always promised, that you would cause rivers and streams in the desert for our sake, that where there was no way, that you would make a way. God, we thank you for this way. Now, God, I pray that you would send the anointing. Let your anointing rest upon me right now, God, as I bring forth your word to your people. God, give me the strength and the endurance, and God, give me the charisma, God, to present this in the fashion that you would have it to go forth. I give you all the praise and all the glory for the opportunity, for the occasion, for the open door. Now, God, it is so by the, by the words of your mouth, God, that you would be with us right now, according to your word, that if we would acknowledge you in everything we say and do, that you would direct our path. Now, God, direct this meeting, direct this broadcast, direct this segment in the name of Jesus. Amen. God bless you. I want to invite your attention to 1 Samuel chapter number 30, verse number 18 and verse number 19 as our printed text, after which we will, amen, begin discussion of our topic. All right. Turn with me now. The word of God is recorded in the Holy Writ and is read. Uh, on uh, this fashion, all right? First um, Samuel chapter 30, verse number 18 and verse 19. And David recovered all that the Amalekites had carried away, and David rescued his two wives. And there was nothing lacking to them, neither small nor great, neither sons nor daughters, neither spoil nor anything that they had taken to them, David recovered all. It is important for you to remember uh, these two passages of scripture, but more particularly, it is important to remember that David recovered all that the Amalekites had carried away, and David rescued his two wives. Now, we're talking about recovery. Uh, that's what we're talking about. Uh, we're not talking about uh, you should have two wives because David had two. No, we're talking about recovery by faith. As we go on in this lesson, you're going to find out uh, what David had to utilize in order to effectuate the recovery that God would give him or grant him. And so therefore, we want to uh, look at that. Now, there's some foundational teaching that's going to have to take place in order for you to understand what I'm going to say in the latter part of this a particular segment of this uh, broadcast. And so we want to get right into that. So uh, when you read verse number 18, the scripture said, David recovered all, right? All means all, that's all all means. Uh, there's nothing that can be added to it. There's nothing that can be taken from it. Uh, it is inclusive. Everything is embodied in the word all. And so I want you to remember that. So when we look at the word pandemic, uh, or panacea, rather, when we look at the word panacea, it means a cure-all, a cure-all, an elixir. It comes from the Greek word meaning all healing. In other words, uh, if you have a uh, panacea, then you have a remedy, you have a cure for everything uh, uh, that you have to deal with. And so that's what we're looking for, is a cure for this pandemic that we are faced with. And we have to look for uh, uh, the, the proper place to find that panacea, right? Originally, we want to set the background, the introduction in the background to the lesson is this. Panacea, was a Greek goddess. Uh, she was a goddess of healing. 
uh, and in the Middle Ages and the Renaissance period, uh, or the period of the Renaissance. Uh, and chemists sought to come up with an elixir that would give um, afterlife or give eternal life. In other words, they were looking for a discovery. They were looking for something that would uh, um, give them eternal life that men would not have to die. Glory be to God. Philosophers even looked for something that could turn ordinary metal into gold. <laughs> but I want to say this to you. They labored and labored to find these cure-alls, but no such medicine was ever found. Glory be to God. There, tell me now, there's nothing that you can name that will cure everything. Uh, I know there have been some things that have come to bear and come forth, and, and we have tried to declare that they will cure, cure everything. But if anybody comes to you telling you that they got something that will cure everything, be careful. Glory be to God. Uh, because if you think that the, uh, these little shots that we're taking called vaccine is going to cure everything, it's not going to cure everything because we even find that there are some variants of the COVID-19 that it's not uh, able to even deal with. And so, in fact, it's not a cure-all at all. It is more a impact-reducing uh, uh, effort uh, initiative than a cure-all because having taken this vaccine doesn't mean that you cannot catch the virus. Uh, I am told that it is uh, just to um, reduce the impact uh, in, in the event you do contract the virus. And so that's what we have to understand. It's not a cure-all. Don't ever think that it's going to cure everything, all right? It's just uh, uh, doctors always tell you that certain things have to run their course. It's just like sin. Sin uh, doesn't do anything initially, and you don't think about it initially, but it's after it runs its course. It has to run its course because God has said that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. And so as a result, we have to understand that sin, uh, when it is finished, after it has run its course, then uh, you have to deal with the aftermath. And so it's the same with this uh, um, uh, pandemic, with this uh, uh, issue that we're dealing with with this virus. Uh, it just has to run its course. Uh, God has to do the healing. And if God doesn't do the healing, then uh, you will probably uh, meet your demise, right? So uh, what we know is that there is no solution to all of society's difficulties right uh and it has no solution has ever been found we have had vaccines for smallpox diphtheria mmr that's mumps measles and rubella uh blue bonnet plague uh west Nile, uh swine flu and now COVID 19. uh we have vaccines these are not cures they are vaccines uh we even had one against uh tuberculosis or to TB, uh, but now uh, we find that there have been other outbreaks that have been uh, manifesting of late uh, when we have really, we beat it down and almost eradicated it, uh, but it has the power to re return. And that's why how you know that you have no uh, permanent solution. If it can come back on you, there's no permanent solution. And so we have to under understand that. So I know that this is uh, a little bit off the beaten path, but stick with me. I'm going somewhere with this. Uh, what I want you to remember is panacea means a cure-all, a healing uh, of everything. Uh, and so uh, we have this position that we have no panacea for this COVID-19 virus that we are faced with, and we are having... Uh, as a result of our council session, a suggestion that we can have a recovery by faith. And we're going to, I want to talk to you today about how that faith is connected 
to this particular theme and topic so that we can understand what the originator uh, had in mind when he coined it, all right? Now, so since um, uh, there is no panacea, no cure-all, then panacea is almost always used to criticize the very idea of a total solution. Isn't that amazing how the very thing that we are seeking uh, criticizes the end result? And so therefore, uh, uh, it's more like, it's sort of like an oxymoron. Uh, but uh, what we have to do is have to understand that there is nothing that can make everything all better. And you remember when we were kids and uh, we, we might scrape our, our knee or something like that and we come in the house and, and uh, our parent would uh, clean it off and uh, put a little Vaseline on it. Or back in my day, we had two uh, uh, substances, one called uh, methylate and the other one called mercuricol. And boy, I tell you, uh, they elicited some screams because initially it would burn and then it would calm down. And then the parent would say, see, now we've made it all better. Well, today we don't have anything that's going to make everything all better, all right? And so this brings me to our text. Uh, 1 Samuel chapter 30. Let's begin with verse number 1. And uh, we'll read down uh, through our lesson because this is uh, the lesson that we're having now, at the close, we're going to close out with prayer. We're going to have the prayer because this is a prayer clinic. But I want to lay the foundation for what we're going to do at the end. All right. So verse number one, it came to pass when David and his men were come to Ziklag on the third day that the Amalekites had invaded the south and Ziklag and smitten Ziklag and burned it with fire and had taken the women captives that were therein, they slew not any, either great or small, but carried them away and went on their way. Now, what you have to understand is David and his army is three days journey away from his base camp in Ziklag and therefore have no chance and no opportunity to try to ward off or fight off the Philistines. You see, that's the way the devil is. He'll wait until you become the most vulnerable in order to attack you when you're at the least place and point where you can fight. And so as a result, uh, David's camp got invaded uh, and they took away all of the women and uh, children and everything, his possessions and everything. So verse 3, when David and his men came to the city, and behold, it was burned with fire, and their wives and their sons and their daughters were taken captives, then David and the people that were with him lifted up their voice and wept until they had no more power to weep. You know, uh, sometimes we have experiences in our life where we... Um, grieve and we cry and we weep until uh, we have no more tears to weep. And then uh, that's when God tells us to dry our eyes. And then we can begin to do something about it because uh, you can't do anything while you're weeping and while you're grieving. But when uh, the men finish uh, their crying and their weeping and had lost all of their strength, you know, they say that's when the anointing of God kicks in. Uh, whenever we come to the end of ourselves, then God picks up from that point. So verse 5, David's two wives were taken captive, Ahinoam, the Jezreelite, and Abigail, the wife of Nabal, the Carmelite. And David was greatly distressed for the people spake of stoning him because the soul of all the people was grieved, every man for his sons, and for his daughters, but David encouraged himself in the Lord. It's amazing how you can be uh, good friends and partners and uh, be very close with someone and then 
uh, something happens and everybody want to blame uh, somebody for it, uh, want to blame you for it. So David was getting the blame and I can hear what they were saying in their hearts that if we had not been away with you uh, fighting a, a campaign and been at home taking care of our families, this never would have happened. And as a result, uh, they looked at David as to say, David, it's your fault that we lost our wives and our children, and therefore uh, we ought to stone you to death because you're the one to be blamed. But that's not, amen, the truth. Uh, David became very, very depressed as a result of this. And um, the Bible said that, that David had to encourage himself in the Lord. Uh, and so uh, we are no different. Sometimes we have, when we'll reach times in our lives when we have to encourage ourselves. Someone, even during this pandemic, may have had to encourage yourself because you became complacent and you began to get discouraged because of the sheltering in, because of the restricted activities, uh, because of the lack of fellowship, uh, because of the seclusion that we had found ourselves you know, in. Uh, coming from a time and a place where we could go anywhere we wanted to go, talk to anyone we wanted to talk to, as long as we wanted to talk to them and do about what we wanted to do. And sometimes we did that at the expense of the time that we should have been worshiping God. Sometimes uh, folk would be out on the golf course on Sunday morning while service was going on, boat riding, glory be to God, four-wheeling, uh, doing uh, washing cars, you know, cutting grass, or, or doing whatever they wanted to do, glory be to God, uh, uh, when it was time for worship. But God set in motion uh, a sequence of events that caused us not to be able to engage in all of those things and took us to the place where oftentimes we've had to encourage ourselves. I don't know who I'm talking to today, but somebody, including not, not just myself, but somebody have reached and have gone through something where you had to encourage yourself. Well, this is one of those times for David. David, amen, has lost his wives, his children, his possessions, as well as his camp because they had burned the camp also. And so he had to start back from scratch. And so therefore he was uh, 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 greatly discouraged and had to encourage himself. But this is what I want you to pay attention to, and that is what David did when he found himself discouraged because of what was going on around him, because of what was going on down here on planet Earth. This is what David did. Verse 7, the Bible said, David said to Abiathar, the priest, Ahimelech, son, I pray thee, Bring me hither the ephod, and Abiathar brought hither the ephod to David. Oh my goodness, David requested the ephod. Now there's, there's two things I need to deal with at this juncture. Uh, first of all, I got to deal with what the ephod is, the role that it played in the scheme of things of what David is doing because of where he found himself. Also, I have to bring into place uh, the information that you're gonna need to be able to process what we're going to say going forward, all right? Now, let me explain this. The ephod was a inner garment uh, worn by the high priest uh, that was attached to the breastplate of the high priest and the inside of the ephod uh, there were two elements and I don't want to get ahead of myself but I want to talk about a little bit of the vesture of the high priest. The high priest wore a breastplate and attached to this breastplate were 12 stones and these stones represented the 12 tribes of Israel the people of God, and it signified that the, God's people were close to his heart and that he cared for them and he loved them. And this um, 
12 stones upon this breastplate signified this. Now, not only that, the high priest, uh, as he approached the holies of holies, uh, he carried uh, a canister or an incense canister and burned incense. And the incense that burned in the canister uh, was to be a smoke uh, of a sweet smelling savor that covered the stench of the burning flesh of the sacrifice that had been made unto God. Uh, they were not willing to allow the stench uh, from the sacrifice to proceed into the nostrils of God. Instead, they preferred God to have a sweet smelling savor before him because the idea is to obtain favor from God. Now, as you see the apparel of the high priest, uh, the breastplate and the, uh, the, 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 the incense canister and, and the other garments and vestiture, the, the turban upon his head, but there's two things uh, that is a part of the ephod that you are not able to see, but the high priest would always carry them in his bosom. And they were called the Urim and the Thummim. And these two uh, elements were two stones that he carried on the inside of his vesture next to his heart. And it was uh, a part of the Israelite culture and history that these two uh, stones, the Urim and the Thummim, provided answers for the priest when he reached a point and a place of decision making that he could not make of his own, but he needed the help and the guidance of God himself. In other words, he needed an answer from God. And I say to you that if you come into your camp and it's been destroyed and all your family taken and everything taken and you don't even know which way if they went, you don't know anything about where to start. Listen, you need to get in touch with God and you need to do it immediately. And so David did not hesitate. This is why he said unto Abiathar, amen, bring me the ephod, which was usually made out of linen. And David, amen, put on the ephod, went into the hole, went into the place of fortification and stronghold to meet, amen, to the presence of God. Why? Because I need to hear from God. The only way I'm going to get through this is I need an answer to get an answer from God. And I submit to you, that is where we are with this pandemic right now. We need an answer from God. And I ask you, how are we going to please God? How are we going to serve God if we don't pray, if we don't talk to God? Amen. We need an answer. Amen. And we need it right away. And I think of the song, not another second, not another minute, not another hour, but I need you now. And I can imagine this being on the mind of David saying, I need God now. I need to get in touch with God now. And so then the Bible declares that David sought the Lord. The only way to seek God is through prayer. Amen. That is his communication uh, 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 line. That's how he communed with us, through prayer. Glory be to God. Upon the mercy seat. Isn't that what he promised? Uh, amen. Uh, 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 Moses, that I will, uh, Aaron, I will commune with you. Amen. Upon the mercy seat between the seraphims. Glory be to God in the Holy of Holies. That's why the high priest had to go in there. Glory be to God. Every time, amen, he went in there, he had to commune with God. And we're going to pick up here when I come back. I want to talk a little bit more about this Urim and Thummim. All right. Stay with us. It's going to get interesting. And take thou unto thee Aaron thy brother and his sons with him from among the children of Israel, that he may minister unto me in the priest's office. And thou shalt make holy garments for Aaron thy brother for glory and for beauty. And these are the garments which they shall make, a breastplate and an ephod and a robe and a broidered coat, a mitre and a girdle. 
and they shall make holy garments for Aaron thy brother and his sons, that he may minister unto me in the priest's office. And thou shalt take two onyx stones, and grave on them the names of the children of Israel, six of their names on one stone, and the other six names of the rest on the other stone, according to their birth. And Aaron shall bear their names before the Lord upon his two shoulders for a memorial. And thou shalt put in the breastplate of judgment the Urim and the Thummim, and they shall be upon Aaron's heart when he goeth in before the Lord. And Aaron shall bear the judgment of the children of Israel upon his heart before the Lord continually. Welcome back. We are back and we're going to pick up right where we left off with David uh, going into the hole. Uh, going to his place of prayer. And in verse 8, the Bible says that David inquired at the Lord, saying, Shall I pursue after this troop? Shall I overtake them? And he answered him, Pursue, for thou shalt surely overtake them, and without fail, recover all. Now, what is interesting at this juncture is that David didn't know where they were. He didn't know which way to go in order to pursue after them. Glory be to God. So he had to have faith and confidence in the word of God that God would show him which way to go and where to find his enemy. And that's what the problem is that we have today is that if we can find this virus, we could destroy it. If we knew where it was, we could defeat it, but we don't know where it is. And so as a result, we need some intel before we can pursue after and destroy this enemy. And so as a result, we need, amen, to get in touch with God so that God can reveal some things unto us. And so then uh, we're going to follow this out and, and draw a parallel between what David was facing and what we're facing in this pandemic so that you will understand from this point how we're going to have a pandemic recovery by faith. David had to have faith. Now, the Bible says that David took 600 men and began to pursue after his family and their families but what I have to understand, what I want you to understand is, how did he know which way to go? Because God really had not revealed to him just yet where his enemies were in camp. But David struck out, and I believe that God gave him divine guidance. Sometimes God can order your steps and give you guidance without even speaking to you. And you won't even understand why you end up in a certain place because God have ordered your steps, all right? And so they struck out, amen, not knowing where they were going. He had 600 of them. I want you to understand something here at this juncture. These men were tired. They were exhausted. They had just returned from a major battle that had lasted, amen, for a substantial period of time, and they were just getting back to their base camp and looking to rest. And lo and behold, they come into the situation where their camp had been ravaged and their people had been taken and everything destroyed, even their campsite. And so as a result, uh, they were in a uh, fatigued situation. But yet 600 men struck out with David. And so David came to the river. And before he crossed the river, there were 200 who were so exhausted and so tired that, and so weak that they couldn't even get across the river. And so David left them and proceeded with the 400, all right? And so uh, here David is with 400 fighting men going to recover his stuff. I don't know who I'm talking about, but talking to today, but maybe you've lost something and maybe you need to inquire of the Lord whether or not you need to let it go or whether you need to pursue after it and recover it. And so as a result, God will give you the answer. That's the important thing is that in order for us to overcome this pandemic, in order for us to defeat our enemy, we going to need the help of God. And the only way we're going to get it is through prayer and faith 
and confidence in the blessed word of God. 500,000, over 500,000 people have died from this pandemic and 28 million affected by it. And we still, as a nation, have not learned that we need to pray more than ever before. We need to get in touch with God. Amen. We don't need another vaccine. We need, instead of taking a vaccine, we need to take time, amen, to get before God and pray and ask God how to get through this situation. Glory be to God. And this is why this is parallel to the theme and the topic that I'm talking about on today, glory be to God, uh, prayer, the panacea for the pandemic. Prayer is a cure-all. There is nothing that prayer cannot cure, glory be to God. That's why it's the only panacea that we have available to us, glory be to God, to utilize in the situation that we're in. David recognized that very early, glory be to God, and sought God, and as a result, got an immediate Amen. Victory because he got in touch with the God of the universe and used his amen direction. And so as David and his men went, he and uh, his men, as they uh, pursued, they came to, in verse 11, uh, a, an Egyptian in the field and they brought him to David. And this Egyptian uh, had been uh, there for three days and three nights and had not eaten uh, and not drank any water and he was very faint. And so they gave him uh, a cake of figs and, and uh, two clusters of raisins and when he had eaten, verse 12, said his spirit came again to him for he had not eaten no bread nor drink, drunk any water three days and three nights. And David said unto him, verse 13, to, to whom belongest thou, and whence art thou? And he said, I am a young man of Egypt, servant to an Amalekite, and my master left me because three days ago, three days ago, I fell sick. He left him for dead. Glory be to God. He left him for dead because he got sick and they did not want the burden of carrying him back to their camp. Now, all of this is very interesting because what you need to understand is the Amalekites wasn't even supposed to be in existence anyway. They were supposed to have been completely annihilated before David ever even came on to the scene because God had instructed Saul to completely annihilate, destroy the Amalekites, but he didn't do that. And that's what happens when we don't do what God instructs us to do according to how God instructed us to do it. And so now he's still having to deal with the backlash of this problem that Saul did not resolve. All right. So let's continue with the story. So now this uh, Egyptian that they found abandoned and uh, almost dead uh, after having uh, his spirit returned to him. Uh, testified to David that we made an invasion upon the south, uh, verse 14, uh, of the Sheratites Sher Sher and upon the coast which belongeth to Judah and upon the south of Caleb, and we burned Ziklag with fire. That was the key piece of intelligence that David needed to know that he was on the right trail. And so from there, David said to him, Canst thou bring me down to this company? And he said, Swear unto me by God. This is this is the one true God. See that spelling of God G capital G O D, the one true God. Because apparently he knew David's God. And so as a result, he said, Swear, and he knew that David would not go back on a word that he had promised and given to his God. So he said to David, swear by God, by, by, by God unto me that thou wilt neither kill me nor deliver me into the hands of my master and I will bring thee down to this company. I can imagine David saying in his heart right then, if you bring me to, down to them, 
I'm going to handle the business from there. I don't know what's going on with those 200 that were so weak and faint they couldn't get across the river. But let me tell you something. If that had been my gal, I'd have found strength from somewhere to get across that river and continue the pursuit after my family. And so now David realizes I'm on the right track. God has answered my prayer. Now he's not shooting in the dark. Now he's not chasing an enemy that is evasive and elusive to the extent that he don't know where to find it. David now has intelligence, glory be to God, to find where his problem lie. And the rest of the story, David and his company went down, amen, to where the uh, Amalekites, uh, the Philistines, uh, I mean the Amalekites, uh, were encamped. And he slaughtered them from morning, noon to night, took back all of his family, took back his spoil, and took their spoil. And 400 of them fled on camels. Glory. Because David, amen, had give, been given the victory. God had given him what he had declared to David. You will restore and recover all that was lost. In verse number 18, David recovered all and the Amalekites, little repeated that they had carried away and rescued his family. And the Bible said there was nothing lacking. Listen, when God bring us through this pandemic, you won't have anything lacking. Some of you are doing better now than you were doing before the pandemic. And, 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 and yet, we can't explain how we are doing better now than before the pandemic. But God has a way of taking the worst things that occur in our life and spinning them around and making something good come out of it. And so what we have to know, too, is that we uh, must have obstacles in our path, things that are hard and difficult and struggles in our path in order for something great to come out of it. No, nothing of any great magnitude have came from laying on side the road, watching the traffic go by, and you not doing anything with any diligence to improve your own situation. But God is a rewarder of the diligent. And David would never have recovered his family if he could have, would have stayed there having a pity party with himself and the rest of the camp saying, I don't know what I'm going to do. There's no way for me to know. There's nothing I can do. Glory be to God. But he became proactive. He got on his knee. And I don't know who I'm speaking to today, but when you come are confronted with a situation where you don't know what to do, you don't have the answer, you need to use that urine and thumbing that God gave you when he filled you with the Holy Ghost, those two stones that are in your bosom that are symbolic of acquiring answers from God, use it, use it. But you got to pray. You got to learn to pray. That is the panacea that you have. That's your cure-all. You can always pray. No matter where you go, no matter what anyone do to you, you can always pray and meditate on the goodness of God. And that is the answer to the situation that we are confronted with right now, all right? So we have to understand that. And so what we want you to see concerning this lesson is that prayer is the only panacea. Prayer is the only panacea. Man have tried to uh, concoct different things and come up with different solutions, and, but he's never been able to come up with a solution, uh, uh, an all curing, an all healing solution for every occasion. Prayer is never, ever out of season. Glory be to God. It is the only thing that we have that is always appropriate for us to do. And so we have to understand that. And so we have to don't not focus on, because uh, I have to be honest with you, there are some people who lost some stuff during this uh, 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 pandemic. This is uh, There's a lot of people who lost their jobs. Some have lost their homes. Uh, some have lost their help. Uh, and some have lost their wealth. And so therefore, there's a lot of people who, who have lost 
a lot of things during uh, this pandemic. But God will restore to you, just like he did to David. Everything that you lost is coming back. God's going to restore you. He's going to reward you. You're going to recover it. But you've got to do it God's way. Our way will no longer work, no longer suffice. God has reached a place where we are put in a situation now where we are going to either acknowledge God or we're going to perish in our sins. And so that's what we have to understand and we have to know. All right? We have the antidote. We have the church have the panacea. The church have the cure-all. The church have eternal life. There's no other group. There's no other institution that claims eternal life except the church. And the reason that we have this is because of the prayers of the righteous, because of the goodness of God that extended it to us. And so why wouldn't you want to pray unto the God that have brought us even this far, even to this day, even to this hour? We faced pandemic, pan pandemics before. The difference is people were praying more back in 1918 and 1919 than they are now. We have reached a place now where people don't even want to pray anymore. Glory be to God. And, and, and you can tell by the number of people that attend prayer calls by the number of people that really pray. You can find somebody to clean the restroom quicker than you can find somebody to pray for you. Glory be to God. And so it ought not to be that way. So God is allowing us to get ourselves together because he's not going to reveal himself until we come together, until we get it together, until we lay before the throne of grace, glory be to God, and ask God, for the answer, David said unto God, shall I pursue or shall I forbear? In other words, do I go or do I stay at home? And God says, pursue. That was his answer. When God gives you the answer, you don't have to worry about the rest of it. He got that. He's handled, he, he can handle his part. You got to handle your part. But you got to go to God. And remember this. You got to go to God for the answer. The high priest, that's where he always went for the answer. When he didn't have the answer, he didn't know what to do or what decision to make. He went to God for the answer. Here, David doing the same thing. And I can personally testify it works. I do the same thing. Now, if we can start a chain reaction of people relying on God for the answer, this thing will be behind us before you know it because God has a way to instantaneously or superimpose the answer into the minds of scientists that they have never been able to discover up to this point. But we have to acknowledge him. God just wants us to acknowledge him. And when we acknowledge God, then God will help us. Glory be to God. And so we must pray and we must pray together as a unified body, as a unified pe a group of people that God will help us. And we're preparing to go before the throne of grace. I'm going to use the remainder of this time to go before the throne of grace, seek the face of God, and I want you to find your prayer spot because I want every heart praying. We need every heart uh, that we can muster to pray like you never prayed before, but I need you to pray with earnestly. I need you to pray earnestly. I need you to pray uh, uh, as if your life depends on it, because it does. Because listen, if more than a half million people have died from this uh, 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 COVID-19 already, it will only be a matter of time before it gets to our home. And so therefore, we must pray. We must pray like we never prayed before, we must lament. We must call on the name of God and ask God to turn our captivity before uh, the sorrow comes to our door, come to our house. It's already come to many of our families because many of us have someone in our family 
or we know someone close to us that have been affected by this pandemic. And so therefore, uh, we know what the detrimental effects can be from this virus. And so we need God's help and we need it right early. All right. Those of you that are going to pray with me and found your prayer spot, I need you to get, get down on your knees. And I want you to lament with me before God at this time. Let us go before the throne. Father, in Jesus' name, Lord, we thank you for this opportunity. We thank you for this occasion, God, to come together in this platform, God, to seek your face, God, and to seek you for the answer, the panacea. God, the science, amen, doesn't have it because if science had it, they would already have used it. God, only you have reserved the answer to this problem unto yourself. But God, we are praying and seeking your face now to reveal and uncover uh, to man, God, the answer that will translate us from where we are to where we need to be. God, we give you the praise and the glory for what you have already done and how you have sustained us and brought us even to this hour in the wake of all those who have perished in the fire. God, you said, God, that 10,000 shall fall at our right hand. Glory be to the danger shall not come near unto us. God, but we thank you for not allowing danger to overtake us. God, we thank you for how you have provided for us, how you have kept us, how you have shielded us. God, you have kept our children safe, kept our families safe. God, you have allowed us to even work from home. God, many of us are working from home like never before. God, because you made a way for us to do it. God, before the foundation of this thing ever took place, God, you made a way, God, for us to escape. You made a way for us to make, make a living. You made a way for us to eat, God. You made a way for us to pay our bills, God. You made a way, God, for us to obtain even more than we already had before we sheltered in. And God, for that, we are thankful. God, we pray now for those 28 million cases of this COVID-19, God, that have taken place throughout the world. And God, we thank you, God, that you are able, you're still merciful, God. In spite of what we go through, you're still merciful, God, because we recognize, God, that we should have died a long time ago, that you would still be just if you had destroyed the face of the earth. God, so we recognize that we have no claim of right, but God, we are seeking your mercy. God, we are seeking your compassion. God, we are seeking your grace, God. Eh, God, that you would help us and you would do it right early, that you would do it right now, God. And I thank you for it in advance for what you're about to do. God, I thank you for it. God, we thank you also, God, uh, for keeping our families safe. God, we thank you, God, for not having a sad story to tell on today because you have kept us under the blood. You have kept us safe, God. You have kept our families, God. God, we thank you for that right now in the precious name of Jesus. God, we thank you, God, because some of us have been affected by this virus. Some of us have uh, actually had, amen, the disease. But God, you kept us safe. You allowed them to recover. God, you healed them. God demonstrated the power that you have over all sickness and disease. God, you're not looking for a cure. You have the cure. God, you're not looking for an experimental drug. You have the drug. God, we thank you today for your healing virtue, for your healing power. We thank you, God, for how you have recovered those, uh, many of those who contracted the illness, God, as we continue to go forth. God, uh, again, we thank you uh, for our national body, the Pentecostal Assemblies of the World. God, being innovative, God, uh, enough, God, to continue to find ways to continue to represent uh, the, the truths and the, and the honesty that they embody concerning the word of God. God, I pray that you will continue to bless our national body. Continue to bless God, the presiding bishop of our organization. God, give him strength, wisdom, knowledge, and inspiration. God, I pray that you would do it right now. God, continue to motivate him, God, to do 
the things that must be done, God, while we are going through this situation. I thank you for it right now. Touch his body. God, we know that sometimes he may get weary in his body. He may get tired in his body. But God, give him a refreshing. God, refresh his anointing. God, in the name of Jesus. God, we pray that you will remember, God, our diocesans for each state, God. Give them a refreshing. Give them wisdom, God, to lead their local body to lead the local organization. God, remember the regional directors. God, we pray that you would bless them also. God, give them wisdom and endurance. God, we need all your help right now in order to continue, God, to fight this thing in the fashion that we must fight. God, we need you, God, right now. And God, we are calling upon your name right now in the name of Jesus. God, the one that said in Matthew 28, 19, 28, 18, all power is given to me in heaven and in earth. God, we are petitioning the throne of power. We are petitioning the place where all power emanates, God. We're going to that place, God, and we want to be energized and equipped God, with power from the place of origin of the power so that when we come forth, God, we'll be able to stand. We'll be able to have the endurance that we need, God, to get through the day, to get through the hour, to get through the season. God, we know you're able to do it, and we bind the adversary. We bind the enemy right now in the name of Jesus, God, but we are recovering victory. We are recovering, God, All of those things that the enemy have caused us to lose, all the things that have been stolen and taken, God, we are claiming those right now in the name of Jesus. God, we pray that you would bless each one of our auxiliaries. God, we pray that you would look kindly upon them, keep them encouraged, continue, God, to give us ways, God, through your divine intervention of being able to minister, for being able to carry this great word to carry this great knowledge forward. God, we pray that you would strengthen our nation. God, strengthen America. God, she's been the leader of the world. God, you have set your love upon this country. You have set your love upon this nation. Give our leadership, God, wisdom. God, the cabinet of the president, the legislature. God, give us wisdom. Give us the answer to our dilemma. God, it's a problem of the world. It's our problem, not your problem, but we are petitioning you, God, for resolution. God, continue to bless us financially as a nation. God, unite us as one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. God bless each one of you. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you for this occasion. And until the next hour until we meet again. Shalom.